Okay, so this is our second part of our three-part uh, series on WebMO. Um, this second segment is going to focus a lot more on the practical aspects of, of how to use WebMO, um, how to submit a calculation to Gaussian on the cluster, and how to look at that, that output and uh, interpret it. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time learning some, some new chemistry. We're going to use uh, what well, we learned about orbitals in part one um, and apply that to some organic molecules. Um, specifically, we're going to be looking at lots of uh, oxygen-containing organic molecules and the, the lone pairs on some oxygen molecules. And in this segment, you're going to see how to do almost every calculation that you're going to need to do for the entire semester. Um, and I'm going to encourage you, as we're going through this part, to, to pause the video and to actually log into WebMO and uh, build these molecules as I do and confirm that you can get the, the same uh, output and you're seeing the, the same values. And that'll be a great check for you that you're, you're do doing these calculations properly. And it's going to help you have a lot more success in the Chapter 5 part on molecular modeling. So uh, the first example I want to look at uh, is for water. It's nice and simple and easy. Um, and it's a structure that we're all pretty familiar with. Um, and we're going to start with a geometry optimization. And I talked about that a little bit in part one. Um, but now I'm actually going to show you how to do that. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means. So in order to optimize the structure, you need to create an input structure. Um, and the quality of that input structure is really important. And I'm going to go through some tips for how to make a good input structure. Um, and then WebMO will submit that, that structure uh, with the appropriate uh, input files to Gaussian, which will actually do the calculation. And Gaussian 09 is going to attempt to take whatever starting geometry you put into the, the uh, program uh, to turn it into a good optimized geometry. And it's going to do that by making small changes to the, the interatomic or bonding distances. It's going to make small changes to the uh, uh, angles and the dihedral angles. Um, and if it makes a change that stabilizes the structure, it's going to keep that change and look for other changes that can be made to the molecule until it finds a spot where any changes it makes don't stabilize the structure further. And that's what we're going to call an optimized uh, geometry. So we're going to start out by making an input structure, um, which looks like this. Um, and you'll, you'll notice that all of the oxygens in WebMO are red, all of the hydrogens are white, and so we'll, we'll switch at this point to WebMO and actually make this molecule. Uh, this is the main page for our research cluster in the chemistry department, Phoenix. Um, the image on the screen is a, a picture of what the actual hardware looks like. Uh, we purchased a couple of years ago 48 processors on the cluster exclusively for Chem 344 use. And we have access to a number of processors beyond that when the usage load gets heavy. Um, the important part to know there is that we have a certain amount of resources reserved exclusively for your use, which means that you have to submit your jobs to that part of the cluster. Um, and it also means that since we're part of a queuing system, you don't have to wait for one job to finish. You can submit as many jobs as you want, go away, eat dinner, watch a movie, come back, um, and uh, look at your calculations once they've finished. So from the WebMO uh, homepage, uh, you, I mean, from the Phoenix homepage, you can click on WebMO, which will take you to a login screen. Um, you will or should have received a, a login from the chemistry uh, departmental cluster. Um, your TAs also have your uh, usernames and passwords, and so if you uh, need them, you can contact your TA. Uh, once you log in, you'll see a screen that looks like this. Uh, yours has far fewer jobs than mine does. Mine has thousands of jobs I've run over the last couple of years. Um, generally, uh, you'll see some folders on the left. I highly encourage, uh, while you're in 344, uh, making a new folder for each experiment. Uh, you're going to be doing calculations with about two-thirds of the experiments this semester. Um, I recommend a new folder for each part of Chapter 5, which is our uh, exclusively molecular modeling uh, experiment chapter. Um, over to the right, there's a big long list of all the jobs that you've run. Yours will initially be blank. Um, it gives each of them a job number, a name, tells you what kind of job they are, when they were run, what their status is for whether they're queued up, they're complete, or they're errored. Um, and it gives you a time. And you'll notice on my time list here, some of the jobs took as, as little as eight or five seconds. Um, and some of them took as many as seven hours. 
Um, we're going to uh, rig your jobs this semester to take somewhere between a couple of seconds um, and about three hours. Um, and we're going to choose the level of theory and basis set that is the minimum needed to get you a good answer um, and to get that answer as quickly as possible. Um, and so we're going to specify different levels of theory and basis set in the uh, lab manual and you should use those and I'll talk more about those in a second. So in order to make a new job, uh, to make our water molecule, we go to new job and choose create new job, which brings up a pretty uh, useful uh, and user-friendly building tool. It takes a, a little bit of time to get used to. Uh, you probably will get some Java errors that you can enjoy. Um, make sure you enable Java on your browser for Firefox that involves the security icon up there. Um, and make sure Java is up to date and enabled. And most of the problems people have with WebMO throughout the semester are Java being out of date. So make sure you, you keep that uh, ready to go. So simply clicking on the building tool uh, produces a carbon. By default, this is set up to, to produce carbon atoms. You can uh, choose to make an oxygen atom by clicking build and choosing oxygen. Or alternately, you can just click on your keyboard, the O for oxygen, click on the uh, carbon atom that's already placed, and it will convert it to uh, an oxygen atom. If you want to make a hydrogen, you can hit the H on your keyboard and uh, simply click and drag to, to make some hydrogens. Um, and there we have a, a reasonable water structure. Now, right now, those OH bonds are different because I just drew them by clicking and dragging. Um, there are some tools uh, in WebMO that will clean up the, the structure you're going to use as your input structure to a better one. It's important that you use the cleanup tools. Um, they will speed up the calculation by getting you closer to the right uh, geometry to start with, so the computer has to take fewer steps to get to the optimized structure. Also, if your input geometry is really bad, um, it's entirely possible that the uh, calculation will fail, or the uh, computer program will, instead of taking you to the minimum that you want, the good optimized structure that you're shooting for, it'll take you to some other wacky structure. And so you want to uh, take some time to make sure your molecule makes sense. Um, the cleanup tools are over here on the left as this uh, little uh, brush icon or this wrench. You can also get to the cleanup tools from the cleanup menu and choose comprehensive idealized, which is the, the brush, or comprehensive mechanics, which clever enough is the wrench. Um, the idealized is a pretty uh, quick and easy uh, via CPR style uh, optimization of the structure. The mechanics cleanup does a very simple molecular me mechanics calculation. Neither one is overly great. They happen very, very fast. Um, sometimes they both work uh, wonderfully well. Um, in part three, I'm going to show you an example where both of them uh, fail to, to get a good input structure. Uh, in the case of water, clicking on either of these is, is, is going to work very well. Uh, so there's the uh, cleaned up structure. That looks like a good input structure for water. It's what we're familiar with. It's what we're expecting. Um, I really want to emphasize that when you're building these molecules, before you submit any job and do any calculation uh, with it, uh, you actually look at the molecule, uh, use the uh, rotate tool up in the corner to spin it around and make sure it really makes sense. Make sure that all the atoms are attached the way you think they should be chemically. Make sure all the formal charges are displayed properly. Make sure everything is, is exactly as you'd expect. Um, this is what I'd expect for water. I'd expect a, a bent structure with two uh, equal energy or symmetric uh, OH bonds. And so now in the bottom I can hit continue, which will take me to a screen that allows me to choose which computer program is being used. Uh, we're going to use Gaussian for all of our calculations in Chem 344, so don't ever choose anything else. Um, and the queue that you're going to submit all your jobs to is the Chem 344 queue. Uh, you do not have access to the other cues on the list. Um, and if you try submitting your job to their, uh, any of those cues, you'll probably get uh, an angry red failed message rather than having success. So make sure you choose the Chem 344 queue. Uh, Gaussian is the program that we're going to use for everything. And then you can hit continue. And at this point, this is where you're going to tell Gaussian what kind of calculation you want to do. Um, it gives you a place to put in a, a job name. Uh, it defaults to the chemical formula. I highly recommend using a plan of chemical formula and then uh, some other information about the molecule, in this case that it's water. Um, the calculation type is almost always going to be an optimized plus vibrational frequency calculation. 
The, the first thing that we're going to do when we study any molecule is get a good structure. In order to get a good structure, we need to optimize it. And we're going to use the vibrational frequency part of that um, to, to give us a, a little bit of insight into whether or not our structure is correct. So it's almost always going to be an optimized plus vibrational frequency calculation. The level of theory, um, there's a bunch of choices here from hartree fock to B3-LIP to CCSD. There's an MP2, there's an AM1. This alphabet soup of stuff is not anything that's important for the scope of Chem 344. What you need to know is that the basis set and level of theory are the number of orbitals that are uh, included in the calculation in the basis set and the way in which the calculation is handled in the level of theory. You need to match those to what are in your lab manual. Most of the time, we're going to tell you to do a B3 lip calculation using a 631 GD basis set. So most of the time, this part is going to look just like this, but always check that you're using the right level of theory and right basis set. Uh, probably the second most common error students have when turning in data uh, in Chem 344 is that they've used the wrong level of theory or the wrong basis set. So, so make sure you match that. This is the Becky uh, three-parameter hybridization of the Li Yang par functional, which is information you don't need at all. Um, you just need to know that B3LIP was called for, and so that's what I'm going to use. Um, the charge on a water molecule is zero, and so I'm confirming that that still says zero in the charge box. And all of the molecules you're going to work with this semester are going to be singlets for their multiplicity. The one exception to that is the radical molecules you're going to look at at the end of chapter five. Uh, and there you'll be instructed to set that multiplicity to doublet. So when you're doing this part right, uh, it will have the, the molecule name and chemical formula at the top, type of calculation, which is almost always going to start with an optimization and vibrational frequency calculation, then our level of theory and basis set, and the charge and multiplicity. Hitting continue will send that job to the computer cluster. Um, in the case of the water molecule, this is going to go very, very quickly. Um, how long this takes will depend on the symmetry of the molecule and the size of the molecule. Um, water has some nice symmetry and is small, and so it'll take just a few seconds for this to complete. And this one is already done uh, in a time of 6.6 .6 seconds. Uh, we can then click on the link here, and it'll open up the the structure, and there it is. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about the output in a second, but I want to switch back to PowerPoint for a moment. So here's what happened. The, the structure that I put in is this one that I boxed in red right here. Uh, that's their starting geometry. And I got the energy out of the file already. It started at that energy. Now, that is a giant negative number. Um, all of the energies of the molecules are large and negative, and we're not generally going to be as interested in the absolute value here, the actual energy is how the energy changes. When we submitted this input structure with this energy, Gaussian 09 made some small changes in it. And if you look very, very carefully, after five optimization steps, you can see almost no difference between these two structures. Visually, there's not a whole lot of difference. Um, we will actually look in a second and see exactly how it changed. Um, the angle's a little bit different. The OH bond distance is slightly different. The energy has gone down. Um, we have giant negative number became slightly larger giant negative number, um, which means that we've gone from a higher energy starting geometry to a lower energy final structure. These numbers aren't super useful as these really large negative values. So instead, we like to convert them to uh, relative energies. And we can say that this energy has dropped by 7.3 kcals to get to our optimized structure. And it gives us some insight into how good our starting geometry was um, and uh, where that was relative to our, our final optimized structure. All of the values you're going to turn in in Chem 344 are going to be in kcals per mole. Um, and we're never going to be reporting these sort of giant negative numbers. We're going to be reporting things in relative energies, which are much easier to talk about. Um, some important conversion factors you should keep handy. Um, the energies are going to come out of the calculation in Hartree's, which are not particularly convenient for organic chemists. So we're going to convert them from Hartree's into kcals per mole. 
Um, for those of you who are more familiar with kilojoules, uh, here's a quick conversion between kilocalories and, and kilojoules. So let's look at the output uh, file and get this information. Here's the output structure from our water optimization. Tells us up at the top what kind of calculation it was. It's an optimization and vibrational frequency calculation. Here's the output structure. As we scroll down now, we have a, a number of new tables and bits of information. The first thing it does is it tells us what kind of calculation was run. It was a B3LIP 631 GD calculation, and it was an opt and frequency calculation. Then it gives us the geometry sequence. Um, these three icons are going to get pretty familiar to you. Um, the magnifying glass lets you look at uh, uh, a structure of some sort. Um, the download uh, floppy disk icon here lets you actually export all of those energies into an Excel spreadsheet if you want to do some manipulation in Excel. Um, and there's this animate or movie icon over here that lets you actually see the changes. And so there were, starting from zero, five steps in the optimization, and we can animate those uh, using the movie icon. And if you look very carefully, you could see what just happened, but we can cycle sort of through the steps here. The starting geometry is here at step zero, listed down at the bottom with its energy. And as we step forward, you can see in the first optimization step, made those OH bonds a little bit longer. And then in step two, it changed things a tiny bit. And in step three, I can't see any change. Step four, I see no change. So then it gets to its final structure. So we sort of see the, the changes that the molecule underwent. They were pretty small because our starting guess was pretty good. Um, then it gives us the stoichiometry or chemical formula, tells us the symmetry of the molecule. Uh, you do not need to know too much about point group symmetries for the purposes of Chem 344, but we are going to tell you what the symmetry should be in the lab manual for a number of molecules. You can use that to know if your, your calculation makes sense or not if you uh, have the desired symmetry. Um, the energy we're going to be interested in for each of these is always listed directly below the basis set. Um, in this case, it's listed as the RB3LIP energy because we ran a B3LIP calculation. That energy in Hartree's is the energy we're interested in. We can then convert that to kcals per mole. The other thing that we're always going to look for uh, when doing an optimization and vibrational frequency calculation is this vibrational mode list right down here. This is going to be used to tell us that we're doing a good calculation and we've gotten a good answer. Um, there are three vibrational modes for the, the water molecule. They're listed right here by frequency. We can tell that we probably have a good answer because they all make sense. When you have a correctly optimized reactant, intermediate, or product, a stable molecule, all of these vibrational frequencies will be positive real values. Um, when you're optimizing a transition state, the top one will be a negative value. So we want to confirm that if we're looking for a reactant, an intermediate, or a product, every time we do one of these optimizations, that all of these values are positive. So we, we confirm that, we check, yep, these are all positive, these are all uh, real values, and we can animate them and take a look at them using our little animate button right there. Um, another fun bit is uh, the wacky minds that made Gaussian 09 uh, programmed in thousands of quotes that it shoots out at the end of uh, each successfully completed job. And uh, conveniently, WebMO parses that out of the output for you. So you can entertain yourself and your TAs by uh, sharing those quotes. Um, when having a meeting of the minds, make sure you have the equipment for it. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so we have a, an entertaining quote there, and it gives us the CPU clock time at the very end. And so uh, that's, that's sort of the output as parsed by WebMO. The actual output can be viewed by clicking on the raw output button up here. I encourage you to never care about the raw output. Um, it is in text form and uh, has a lot of information that we're not necessarily going to care so much about. And this is maybe one reason why WebMO is doing us a nice favor because we can use it as a front-end program and not have to decipher all of this text, um, but actually just look at the structures and, and view things that way. So those vibrational modes at the bottom can be viewed by clicking on the animation. 
and it will uh, animate the vibrational mode. And there you can see the, the scissors motion of the uh, OH bonds uh, in the water molecule. So let's flip back to the PowerPoint for a bit here. So there we have our optimized structure of, of water. Um, we see very little change, but maybe just a little bit of bond and a little bit of angle change from our original structure. We've confirmed that it's the good one by uh, looking at the vibrational frequencies. And I really want to emphasize that this is important. Um, a lot of students turn in answers uh, for molecules throughout the semester that instead of being the optimized structure, are actually a nearby transition state. And so you want to make sure that when you're going for anything in any structure that is a, a product, a, an intermediate in a reaction, or a reactant in a reaction, that you have an optimized structure with all positive vibrational frequencies. What that tells you is that it's sitting at the bottom of a well. Uh, it's an optimized geometry, and it's not a transition state. So to recap what we saw with the water molecule, I have this box bit from the vibrational modes. There they are. And again, all of the sort of stable molecules will have all positive vibrational modes. Any transition state will have one imaginary or negative vibrational mode. And I'll show you a couple examples of that uh, on a later slide. Here's the infrared spectrum of, of water. And you can see uh, sort of some OH stretching modes, a symmetric and asymmetric one over here uh, where we have a big absorption in the IR. And then our, our scissors mode over there um, corresponding to that signal. So there are some cute little movies of the uh, three modes of vibration in the water molecule sitting on its IR spectrum. So we can use this uh, calculation to predict the IR uh, frequencies. Most often, uh, in the purposes of 344, we're going to use it to confirm that that top value is positive and that your calculation is probably reasonable. OK, so now let's uh, do what I was talking about in the previous uh, segment. Let's take that optimized structure and use it to get some more information about the water molecule. And in particular, I'd like to know the charge distribution in this molecule. And I'd like to know where the lone pairs are on that oxygen atom. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our optimized structure, we're going to open it up and look at it, and then we're going to click New Job using this geometry. Um, always, uh, any sort of secondary calculation requires a good geometry first. Um, a common mistake people have early on is they, they forget this and they redraw the molecule or they make some changes to the molecule after optimization, which guarantees a, a bogus answer from whatever secondary uh, calculation you're doing. In this case, it's going to be an NBO calculation. So I'm going to flip back to WebMO, and we'll do that. I'm going to reset the viewer here to our optimized structure. And I'm going to choose new job using this geometry, which opens up a new input file with that exact structure. Now, we don't do any cleanup. We don't do any changes. We don't do anything that alters the fact that this is a good optimized structure. We hit continue. It remembers, since I uh, haven't closed my browser, that this is the 344 queue using Gaussian. Anytime you close your browser and reopen it, you need to double check that that is the correct queue to avoid those angry red failed messages. You can then hit co continue. Uh, it takes you back to uh, the exact calculation information you plugged in last time. Where all we're going to do now is change the calculation from an optimized and vibrational frequency calculation to a natural bond orbitals, or NBO, calculation. And that's going to give us some good charge information. It's going to let us view the molecular orbitals. And it's going to let us view the uh, atomic and atomic hybrid orbitals of that molecule. So we'll hit continue. Again, this is a very small molecule. So this is going to happen very, very quickly. Um, and it'll happen sort of here in real time. Um, I'll hit refresh. And there it is in 0.9 seconds. And then we can open up our now complete natural bond orbitals job. It shows us the exact same structure we just had. It's the same one. We didn't make any changes to it. Uh, we just got some new information. And this is parsed into a number of new tables. We have a dipole moment uh, followed by some molecular orbitals the ability to get an electrostatic potential map right there. 
some natural atomic orbitals, a uh, list of natural hybrid orbitals, and a, a list of some natural bond orbitals, um, and a new fun quote. Um, and so we have a, a new output file here and some, some interesting information we can see. Um, so we can click on the magnifying glass next to the dipole, and it'll show us that just as we saw uh, in part one, there's a, a good polarity to this molecule and a pretty healthy dipole moment pulling electron density towards that oxygen. We can click on the electrostatic uh, potential map, uh, magnifying glass, and get a uh, nice 3D color image showing the electron density around that structure. Um, a lot of these uh, uh, potential maps and orbitals are going to start out as these opaque, hard to, to see uh, structures. If you right click on them, uh, you can change the opacity from solid to transparent. You can also get that same change by going up to the preferences icon right there. And then we see these pretty images where we can see where the atoms are located uh, and a, a charge uh, map sort of uh, overlaying it. And so there's our electrostatic potential map on the water molecule. If you click on the natural population analysis, it'll show you a charge uh, on each of the atoms. You can also get the charges out of the list here. Any time in Chem 344 we're interested in the charge on atoms, we're going to use this charge list, the, the natural population analysis list. And so we'll click on that magnifying glass, and it shows us that the oxygen has about a minus 0.9 uh, three charge, and each of the hydrogens have a plus 0.467. Again, red is negative and blue is positive uh, for charge uh, as displayed in WebMO. Okay, so let's uh, go back to our PowerPoint for a minute. Um, we just saw that we took an optimized structure, ran a new job, uh, did a natural bond orbitals calculation, found a, a charge distribution and dipole that looks like that, saw that uh, interesting elect uh, electrostatic potential map. What I want to do now is, is, is look at the lone pairs on the oxygen atom. But before we do that, I want to think about what we already know uh, for the water molecule based on stuff that we've, we've learned in general chemistry and stuff that we've learned in, in high school. And I want to remind you that uh, the oxygen atom in water has two lone pairs on it somewhere up here. And it's got two bond pairs that it's using to make connections to, to hydrogen atoms. Um, and this is one of the classic examples um, that you used uh, when talking about VSEPR, or valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, um, to demonstrate that we can predict molecular geometries from thinking about bond pairs and lone pairs. Um, this is an image that I've uh, borrowed from Wikipedia um, showing this exact idea. Here's a water molecule with two uh, OH bonds and two oxygen atom lone pairs. And it uh, describes that electron arrangement as tetrahedral. Um, and then from there, you can get a molecular geometry that's bent. Well, let's think about this a little bit. Uh, the bent geometry makes sense. It looks just like the optimized structure that we got. Um, Many of you have probably memorized that the bonding angle uh, in the water molecule is uh, 104.7 degrees. Um, and our optimized structure has a, a similar bond angle. So there's our, our actual geometry. We can use an NBO calculation to look at those, those lone pairs. And so let's do just that. So now if we scroll down to our natural bond orbitals list, right here, our natural bond orbitals list, we see uh, all of the orbitals uh, in the molecule 1 through 7 depicted. There's a, a whole bunch more that we can display if we want, but the information we need is right here. We're interested in the lone pairs on the, the oxygen atom, which are listed here as LP1 and 2 on the oxygen atom, which uh, in our job is atom 1. So we, we read this as orbital number two is a lone pair on oxygen, and orbital number three is a lone pair on oxygen. Now, when we looked at that image from VSEPR, we, we saw that oxygen is predicted to have a tetrahedral electron geometry in this case, which means it has two uh, degenerate or equal energy lone pairs uh, around that oxygen atom. Well, we can confirm or reject that idea by taking a look at the, the 
orbitals produced by this NBO calculation. We have uh, lone pair one listed here that's got an occupancy of two electrons. That's not surprising, it's a lone pair. It has the orbital energy listed right here in Hartree's. The second lone pair right here has a slightly different occupancy. It's just below two, okay, so it has a little bit less electron density. And it has a significantly different energy. This right away tells us something's wrong with that VSEPR prediction. VSEPR told us that we'd have a tetrahedral electron geometry and we'd have two equal energy lone pairs. Right away we can see that that's not true. Let's take a look at what those orbitals look like and see if we can make better sense of them. There we go. And we see an orbital that looks a lot like one of those sp3 orbitals we looked at uh, earlier. Uh, the other lone pair can be seen by clicking on its magnifying glass and that looks a lot like this. This looks a lot like a p orbital. Uh, we looked at p orbitals last time and we see the symmetric lobes above and below. Again we can make them transparent by clicking on them. Uh, a cool feature here is that we can click on the uh, binoculars icon up here which synchronizes all of the images to the, the same orientation of the molecule. So if we click on it, we can now look at both lone pairs without the atoms moving and we can flip back and forth between them. And we can see that these are two very different lone pairs. So this is clear evidence that something is wrong with the VSEPR prediction of the, the oxygen uh, lone pairs in water. That lone pair and that lone pair are clearly different. We see that by their shapes, their orientations, we see that by their energies. And so right away, this should make us feel a little bit uncomfortable because we've learned that VSEPR predicts a, a tetrahedral electron geometry. We see that the lone pairs are what's actually a p orbital and something that I'm calling roughly an sp lone pair. You can actually get the hybridizations of both of these orbitals by looking at the natural hybrid orbitals list in the output, which uh, we're going to spend some time with on a later slide. Um, the part that I care about right now is that LP1 here has 0% S character and 99.87% P character. That's really a P orbital. And it's pretty compelling evidence that this is just wrong. And it is. And in fact, that this is this has been known that uh, the oxygen and water does not have a tetrahedral electron arrangement since the 1950s. So this is not shocking new information. Um, VSCPR gets this uh, electron geometry wrong. Um, and this is important for the water molecule, but you're going to find that it's also important to understand the limitations of VSCPR when understanding uh, a number of uh, organic uh, species, which is what we're going to take a look at next. But the important uh, take home message on this slide is that the VSCPR prediction for that oxygen is just wrong. And it gets it wrong because it only takes into account one factor. VSCPR is valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. All it cares about is the repulsion of the, the electrons in the valence shell around an atom. And so it doesn't take into account any other factors that uh, lead to the, the structures and molecules. Um, and as a result, uh, when other factors are at play, it doesn't always get the geometry at, uh, correct, which is what we're going to see in the next uh, few examples as well. So I'd like to switch from water to anisole. Anisole is an organic molecule that in many ways is, is quite similar to water. We have uh, an oxygen atom with two bond pairs, uh, in this case one to carbon uh, as part of a methyl group and one to carbon as part of a phenyl group and it has two lone pairs. So in many ways anisole uh, in terms of the structure around the oxygen is a lot like water uh, as we draw it. Now as with benzonitrile from earlier, um, this oxygen uh, and this phenyl ring can be drawn in a, a few different resonance forms. We can show this one with no formal charges built up anywhere or we can draw these three, which all communicate that this oxygen atom is, is donating electron density uh, into the aromatic ring. Um, and I've shown that uh, you know, the oxygen atom there is part of an electron donating group. This is important. These resonance structures all show that the lone pair on the oxygen 
is connected to the ring somehow, and there's some partial double bond character existing between the, the carbon and the oxygen. And I'd like to explore this computationally. So I want to flip back to WebMO. And then from here, I'm going to exit this job, and I'd like to build a new job of Anasol. So new job, create new job. Again, the drawing tool uh, uh, defaults to carbon, so I can just click and start dragging. If I drag twice, it makes a double bond. And I can draw a six-membered aromatic ring and ask it to clean it up, and it makes something that looks a lot like benzene. Uh, there's an alternate and slightly easier way to do what I just did. Instead of drawing each individual atom, I can just go to the Build Fragment tool and choose to make a ring. And there are several pre-made rings, including benzene. Um, when you get to the part of Chapter 5 that involves making cyclohexanes uh, and chair cyclohexanes, it's critical you use the uh, ring drawing tool. For benzene, it's not so important. Um, the cleanup tools will get you a good benzene regardless. Uh, but I'm just going to go ahead and uh, pop the whole benzene ring in there at once. Uh, if we click Build and then click O on the keyboard for oxygen, we can add an oxygen uh, atom in place of the hydrogen. And maybe I shouldn't have said add there, and I think this is important. We've replaced one of the H's with, with an oxygen. If we add another bond there, we would then have too many bonds to that carbon, and that leads to some other problems. So we replace the, the CH bond with a CO bond. We can draw another bond off that oxygen, and it makes an, an oxygen, which we know it should be a methyl group. So we'll hit C on the keyboard, convert that oxygen to a carbon, um, and then we can clean up from there. At no point uh, when you're working with WebMO should you be drawing lots of hydrogens. The cleanup tools will actually fill uh, any empty valences on the carbon atom uh, or any other atom uh, with bonds to hydrogen. And you can do that by just simply adding the hydrogens. Uh, when you go to clean up, add hydrogens. Or the comprehensive idealized mechanics will add those hydrogens first and then clean up the structure. So I'm going to choose a, a comprehensive mechanics calculation. Uh, it gives me an input structure that looks something like this. Now I want to spin it around a little bit, make sure it makes sense. This looks like what I would expect anisole to, to look like. We have a, a benzene ring here. Uh, attached to an oxygen and a methyl group. Um, the methyl group is in the same plane as the ring. Uh, we'll find out if that should be in that location or not. But this looks to be about the right molecule. Over here, the, the program has noticed that this molecule is almost symmetric. Um, hitting the symmetrized bond locks that in. That tells us uh, that it noticed the molecule is almost perfectly planar with one CH bond below the plane here, one CH bond above the plane right there. Um, all the rest of that molecule is in the plane, which fits with a CS symmetry point group. So there's our, our input structure for anisole. We now hit the arrow for continue. Again, we're submitting to the Chem 344 queue. We hit continue again. Uh, it notices that as a formula of C7H8O, I'm going to call that anisole. And I'm going to choose a, an optimization with a vibrational frequency calculation, and we'll do this again at B3LIP and a 631GD basis set. That'll give us a, a pretty good estimate of the structure of, of anisole, and then from there we can take a look at the orbitals, the lone pair orbitals on the oxygen in the, much the same fashion we did with water. So we'll hit continue. This job's going to take a little bit longer, um, but like any good cooking show, I already have the, the answer ready to go, so we'll, we'll skip the wait. Um, this is the optimized structure of anisole. You'll notice it looks very much like what we put in as the input structure, which tells us that the cleanup tools did a very good job here. We will con convince ourselves that this is the right structure by looking at the vibrational frequencies, which is the, the table here at the, the bottom. Vibrational modes, we're always checking that. And we always want to look to make sure that that first vibrational mode is, in fact, a positive number, and it is. Um, if it was a negative number, that would be a transition state and definitely not the structure of anisole. But it's a positive value, so that's pretty good. And then, again, we have an, a new quote at the bottom. So this is the, the good optimized structure of anisole. 
From here, if we want to know about the charge distribution, so we can confirm that it is an electron uh, donating substituent in the methoxy, or if we want to take a look at those oxygen lone pairs, we do a, a new job from this geometry, and this time we're going to select uh, to do an NBO type calculation. So under calculation, we're choosing the optimize and vibrational frequency to natural bond orbitals. And then we can hit continue and submit that. And that'll give us a nice uh, estimate of the charges as well as the uh, orbitals that those oxygen lone pairs occupy. And again, that job's already complete. So we'll just take a look at that one. Here's our optimized structure. Not a whole lot has changed. Uh, it shouldn't have changed in any way because we started out with it optimized. It ran a natural bond orbital calculation, which shouldn't change the molecule. And now we have the molecular orbitals table. We can use those to look at the, the conjugated pi system. If we click on one of those orbitals, in this case the, the HOMO, you see a nice uh, pi symmetry orbital that looks like that. Um, so we clearly see there's a pi system. And it looks like that oxygen atom might be involved in that pi system. It looks like that oxygen atom has a lobe that's symmetric above and below the plane of the molecule, just like the pi system. We can confirm that by instead of looking at the molecular orbitals, uh, by looking at the natural atomic hybrid orbitals, or just the, the orbitals of those oxygen lone pairs themselves, which are listed here on our natural bond orbitals list, just like in water. Their occupancies are a little bit less than two. They have some different energies right here. And we can get nice pictures of those structures by clicking on the magnifying glass. Here's one lone pair. That looks very similar to what we just saw in the, the water molecule. The other lone pair can be seen by clicking on its magnifying glass. Uh, that would be orbital number 10 here. That looks a lot like that. You can go back to this frame, hit the synchronize button, and now they're in, all the molecules are in the same orientation. And we can see that indeed, this lone pair is significantly different than that lone pair. They are not equivalent, which is further evidence that VSEPR doesn't predict the oxygen lone pairs correctly for anisole. Um, this is an important deal in this case, and something that we probably could have predicted an oxygen lone pair that's in a p orbital is perfectly positioned to be conjugated to the aromatic pi system. And if it aligns itself in the orientation that it currently is, it can share electron density with the neighboring uh, pi system. And somewhere in that list of orbitals, we should be able to find a, a pi 1 orbital, which I, I have. So here's our, our optimized structure of anisole. We see a, a bent structure around that oxygen, which is what we would have predicted for the molecular geometry uh, from VSEPR. When we take a look at those orbitals, we see that the oxygen atom lone pairs are almost exactly like the oxygen atom lone pairs in water and very different than what would be predicted from VSEPR, which is those tetrahedral or symmetric lone pairs. And we certainly don't see that here. We see that one of them, orbital number 10, is almost purely a p orbital. Um, and then this one is something that's listed about sp1.6. So it's a, it's a hybridized orbital somewhere near an sp2 orbital. But this one is definitely a p orbital lone pair. This has big implications for the oxygen lone pair in anisole. It's adjacent to a pi system. We have an sp2 hybridized oxygen, the p lone pair next to a bunch of sp2 hybridized carbons that are part of an aromatic ring. They're using their p orbitals to make the aromatic pi system. If that p orbital aligns with the pi system, we can get a, a much bigger conjugation that also involves the oxygen atom lone pair. And this is exactly how the oxygen atom lone pair is able to donate its electron density into the aromatic system. We actually knew that VSEPR had to get this molecule wrong as soon as we drew these resonance structures. These resonance structures themselves 
communicate that this oxygen has some partial double bond character to the carbon in the ring. That implies that that lone pair has the right symmetry so that it can overlap and donate its density into that pi system. Um, what we're going to find is that when lone pairs or empty orbitals or uh, orbitals containing a radical are adjacent to a pi system, they will have the symmetry that is compatible with that pi system so that it can overlap. And one of the ways to do that is to have... So we, we just saw that this p orbital lone pair on the oxygen is, is conjugated to the, the pi system. Uh, and I, I want to explore that a little bit further. I want to take a look at, at two things. Uh, first, what happens uh, if we change the, the structure of uh, the methoxy group in terms of rotating it relative to the aromatic ring? I'd like to look at what happens to the energy of the, the structure. We're going to do something called a conformational scan to see that. At the same time, we're also going to take a look at the, the structure of anisole and make sure that there aren't other conformational isomers that, that could be lower in energy than the one that we, we obtained. Uh, occasionally, uh, there are multiple conformational isomers of a molecule, uh, and it's, it's worth considering that you, for sure, have the right structure. Um, so we're going to get this exact same uh, plot out of uh, web and we're going to work on a conformational scan. Uh, so the way we do that, is from our optimized structure. Tell it which uh, bond distance, bond angle, or bond dihedral angle involving four atoms you want it to systematically vary. Um, if we're interested in looking at what happens to the methoxy group uh, as you rotate it out of the plane, we're inter interested in thinking about the dihedral angle created by the carbon, oxygen, carbon, carbon uh, part of the, the molecule here. And if we ask it to rotate that from 0 to 360 degrees, we'll see the exact effect of what happens as that, that p orbital that's uh, aligned with the aromatic pi system gets turned out of alignment. And so we'll, we'll see that. Um, and we'll see if there are other possible conformational isomers that are also uh, uh, stable species. So, the way we set that up is to select the four atoms that we want to adjust the dihedral of. So I'm going to click the carbon in the ring. Um, this is a, a weird quirk of WebMO and an important part. If you want to highlight multiple atoms in a way that lets you adjust an angle or measure an angle, uh, when you click on the first atom, you have to hold shift and click on the next three atoms to get the, the four. And then the bottom left, it says dihedral angle of zero. If you actually hold shift first and uh, click the four atoms, nothing useful happens. So the, the key here is to click one atom and then follow the directions of shift click to select more atoms. With the four atoms selected and saying dihedral down here, uh, we can measure it in this mode and it says that that's a zero degree dihedral. In a new job, we're going to tell it to adjust that dihedral by doing the same click method. So one, two, three, four atoms. And now we're going to tell it that we want to adjust or scan that coordinate uh, in, a, in a, uh, an optimization. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we're going to start at zero degrees, uh, ask it to spin to 360 degrees, uh, making 37 steps. And uh, when we hit OK, it will now highlight in gold the adjustments it's going to make to the molecule. So it's going to rotate this methoxy uh, substituent and move the methyl position relative to the other atoms in the ring. When you uh, hit continue to submit the job now, um, it still remembers 344Q for me, but for you, you might need to select that. It now knows that there's a coordinate scan that it's trying to do because um, we selected those uh, dihedral uh, to adjust. So the coordinate scan is set up. Everything else is the same with B3LIP 631GD. You can hit continue. This job will take a lot longer 
because it's going to go through many little steps of adjusting that structure, optimizing at each uh, step, and reporting back the energy. Um, I already have that job completed, so we'll just uh, jump to it. So the, the structure that's displayed is the starting one, and here's our anisole molecule. Uh, it now knows that it's a slightly different type of job, and what's uh, important is that there's now a coordinate scan table that's listed, um, and it lists the uh, coordinate of that dihedral uh, from minus 180 about down to 180. Um, it uh, has the energies listed um, alongside it. Um, you can get all the information you need by looking at the two columns of numbers, but that's not overly helpful. Um, if you click on the magnifying glass, it'll make a plot for you directly in WebML. If you click the download button here, it'll actually pull out that data into Excel, which is uh, uh, convenient for making a much prettier graph. It's also convenient for changing these numbers from heart trees into a more useful KCAL unit. But if you want to just click on the, the view button, you can see the, the graph there, and you see that it goes through an energy minimum at minus 180, an energy maximum at about 90, an energy minimum at zero, and another maximum uh, at 90 degrees in the positive direction, and another minimum at 180. The other thing you can do, which is kind of useful, is click on the uh, animate icon here, and it'll actually show you the uh, changes of the, the molecule as it goes through that dihedral. Um, the energies are displayed at the bottom with each uh, coordinate, um, but it's pretty uh, difficult to read those as they sort of fly by. Um, but you can sort of animate the, the changes as well. I've already pulled that data out into Excel and matched it up with the structure of the molecule. So the starting point right here is this zero degree dihedral where the carbon on the end and the carbon on the other end are eclipsing each other or in a zero degree conformation. Um, and this is now displayed rotating 180 degrees in the positive, 180 degrees in the negative, um, which gives us 360 degrees of total rotation. And what we see is that at minus 180, where the uh, methyl group is aimed away from us, it's essentially the exact same energy as with the methyl group in the plane kind of at angle toward us, which makes good sense because the stabilizing and destabilizing effects of the molecule are exactly the same. Um, the oxygen atom bone pair is perfectly positioned to conjugate in this conformation. Um, and so we're going to get the same energy that we have here. What's interesting is sterics don't play a, the most important role in the stability of this molecule. As we move the methyl group out of plane, we actually see it moving farther uh, from the CHs that are part of the aromatic ring and further away from those, those parts of the molecule, reducing the total steric impact of the methyl group. But we still see a rise in energy as we go from uh, minus 180 to minus 90, when this methyl group is perpendicular to the ring, we're at an energy maximum. The sterics have been reduced, but the conjugation of that p orbital has been broken. And that cost of breaking the conjugation of the p orbital greatly raises its energy, uh, in this case by just over 3 kcals, more than the stabilization that it gets from uh, reducing the sterics can account for. And as a result, this is a transition state. And you'll notice I put a little double dagger symbol on there to acknowledge that it's a transition state. This is not a stable conformation of anisole. Uh, if we rotate further to get back into plane, that uh, is the zero degree conformation we started with. The conjugation is restored, so that p orbital is, is able to overlap with the pi system, where right, the exact same energy we had. If we rotate another 90 degrees, Again, we get to a transition state where that steric repulsion is at a minimum because that methyl group is as far away from those CHs as possible. But we've also broken the ability of the P orbital and the oxygen to conjugate with the pi system. So that's why that is a transition state. And it can fall back to 180 degrees. Now, there are going to be cases where you see a potential energy surface like this for a coordinate scan where these species are different molecules, in which case there might be multiple conformational isomers that need to be considered for a structure. In this case, they all happen to be the exact same structure, 
So we only need to consider one conformational isomer for the, the stable structure of anisole. These structures up here are transition states. They result from the loss of conjugation. The actual structure has that oxygen nicely conjugated to the, the aromatic ring. Um, again, uh, as a reminder from the last slide, this is in a, a lone pair in a p orbital, and exactly opposite what would be predicted if uh, VSEPR uh, were predicting the oxygen lone pair. So we've seen two examples where VSEPR uh, fails to get the, the right hybridization uh, of the lone pair of orbitals um, and the right geometry for the electrons around the oxygen. I'd like to take this one step further and look at furan, which is again uh, an oxygen atom that has two lone pairs and two bond pairs. And so VSCPR would predict this to be a tetrahedral electron geometry. And I think this is a great example of a molecule that causes a lot of problems for people first learning about aromaticity and orbitals in software level organic courses. One of the things you learn about aromatic molecules um, is that they have 4n plus 2 pi electrons. And so one of the things you learn to do is count the electrons. Well, clearly, these two pi bonds each contribute to electrons, which gives us four total electrons in the pi system. The, the question is really what to do with the, the lone pairs. If VSCPR is correct, uh, neither one of these lone pairs is in a p orbital and conjugated to the, the pi system, so the molecule wouldn't be aromatic. Um, however, it's well known that furan, furan is an aromatic molecule, and we can see that uh, using WebMO pretty easily. So again, I'm going to flip to WebMO. We'll start a new job. Build furan, which at this point should be pretty easy. We can click and drag and make some double bonds and single bonds. Convert our carbon to an oxygen. And now we have a structure that looks like a terribly uh, drawn furan. If we pick the cleanup tools of cleanup idealize uh, or the cleanup uh, comprehensive mechanics, we should get a reasonable structure that looks like this. The program notice it has some symmetry. It's uh, a planar molecule and has a uh, plane of symmetry uh, perpendicular to that down the middle. So that looks pretty good for what I'd expect furan to look like. Um, that planar structure helps me think that this might be an aromatic molecule like benzene, which is what I suspect, so this feels pretty good. Uh, when you're satisfied that you've got a, a good uh, cleaned up structure, it's well drawn, uh, and you feel like it's a reasonable starting point, we can hit continue. Uh, submitting to the 344 Q again, we're going to do an optimization and vibrational frequency calculation. And again, we're always doing an opt with the vibrational frequency calculation so we can confirm we've got the right structure. Um, choose a B3 lift 631 GD calculation, and we can uh, submit that job. This one's going to take a, a couple of minutes, um, but I conveniently already have that one completed. So we can take a look at the output for Fioran. Um, I really want to emphasize, when you're done with a job and opening up an output file, make sure you rotate the molecule around and make sure that it looks chemically meaningful. Uh, this looks right. Uh, if you have a really bad input structure, there are times where parts of the molecule might come off, atoms will end up several angstroms away, things could be in very strange orientations. This looks like a pretty reasonable structure chemically, so I feel good about that. And when we scroll down to the vibrational frequencies list, um, all of the uh, vibrational frequencies are positive values. Um, no, the, notice that the first one's a positive number. If any of them weren't going to be positive, it would be the top one, because they're listed in increasing frequency order, so this is a good structure. And from here, once we have that good structure, we can do a new job from this geometry. We can now select an NBO job and look at the lone pairs on this oxygen atom. And so we'll, we'll let that go.
now that we have our completed NBO job, again we see the same structure, and we can get the mole pair uh, pictures from the same sort of list we've been using, LP1 on our oxygen atom and LP2. Again, they have different energies, different occupancies. These are clearly not the equivalent orbitals that would be predicted by VSEPR. One of them looks very much like the orbital we'd expect from water. The other one looks like a P orbital, very much like the other oxygen lone pair we would see from water. And so clearly VSEPR uh, is, is struggling to, to handle this molecule as well. So what we just saw was uh, these two lone pairs, um, this one which is clearly a P orbital, and this one which is about an SP 1.7, uh, we'll call it roughly an SP 2 orbital. Um, these are the two oxygen lone pairs. They're not the uh, equivalent ones we'd expect from VSEPR. And so again, VSEPR gets this molecule badly wrong. And in this case, believe in VSEPR will cause you to have a misconception about furin. Um, knowing that this is a P orbital lone pair that contains two electrons, and it's aligned with and adjacent to these two pi bonds, we now have six electrons in the pi system. This is, uh, satisfies the, the Huckel number of 4n plus 2 pi electrons. Furan is definitely an aromatic molecule, and it requires that that, that lone pair be in the pure orbital in order for that to be true. It's also important to know that this other lone pair is oriented in such a way that it can't overlap above and below the plane effectively. It is not conjugated to the rest of the pi system. So we have two electrons from each uh, of the pi bonds, two electrons from one of the lone pairs, that gives us six total electrons, the other lone pair not conjugated. The result of that is this pi system here, uh, where we see a nice overlap from the oxygen all the way around back to the oxygen, and good evidence for the aromaticity of furan. This indicates that that oxygen atom is pretty close to an sp2 hybridization, um, and not really the sort of tetrahedral shape that we often expect from VSEPR and would probably lead us to assign an sp3 hybridization at that oxygen atom. And really it's a, a third case of VSEPR failing for oxygen. And in fact, um, it typically fails to predict a p-lone pair on uh, oxygen atoms that contain two lone pairs. Um, and so we saw water, we saw anisole and furan, but this is also true on many, many other molecules that include two electron pairs on oxygen. And this is really important when you're thinking about the reactivity of those lone pairs, as well as whether or not those lone pairs are conjugated to some other pi system, like in anisole or in furan. So I'm going to wrap up part two by looking at a, a final uh, bit here. I want to look at species that have exactly one uh, lone pair on an oxygen atom. And so I'm bringing hydronium back from part one to take a, a little bit closer look at it. I have two possible drawings here of, of, of hydronium. One that shows it as a trigonal planar shape, and one that shows it as a trigonal pyramidal shape. If we don't believe VSEPR, and we assume that it fails here as well, um, it reasons, uh, stands to reason that uh, the lone pair would be in a P orbital. And we could have a P orbital lone pair above and below the plane here, which would result in a trigonal planar shape for the rest of the molecule. VSCPR would predict that it has a tetrahedral electron geometry, and that we have a lone pair uh, mostly residing with its electron density above the molecule here, and the rest of the molecule in a trigonal pyramidal shape. We can determine which of these is the, the correct structure of hydronium uh, by optimizing each of these structures the D3H trigonal planar shape, or the C3V trigonal pyramidal. The output of each of those optimizations includes these vibrational frequency modes, and we can use this to determine which of them actually is the structure of hydronium. Structure on the left, the trigonal planar one, has a negative vibrational frequency, 
This tells us right away that that is a transition state. I've already animated that mode um, right here on the bottom. You can see a video of that negative vibrational mode. You click on the animate button. Uh, it'll display this in WebML for you. Um, you can see that the OH bonds are moving out of the plane, which is an indication that a planar structure is not correct for uh, hypermium. And instead, the, the negative mode carries those, those hydrogens out of the plane and carries it towards a trigonal pyramidal shape. Um, that tells us that this is probably the true structure of the molecule, and an optimized trigonal pyramidal uh, hydronium has all positive modes. And so it tells us that this is the minimum structure for hydronium. The energy difference between these two is actually pretty small in this case. Uh, it's a little bit less than a kcal per mole, um, so it's not substantial, but this is the true structure of the minimum for hydronium which tells us that VSCPR actually does a pretty good job on this one. It predicts that we have a trigonal pyramidal shape for the molecule, a tetrahedral electron geometry, which includes this hybrid orbital with its electron density above um, and a little bit below the plane. Uh, clearly not a symmetric p orbital, but some sort of hybrid orbital. Um, and the conclusion here is that for oxygen atoms with a single lone pair like hydronium, uh, VSCPR predicts the structure pretty well, and so it has its limitations, um, but in many cases it actually does a, a reasonable prediction. So what I'd like to do is summarize uh, at the end of part two here, a generalized procedure for getting a good structure of a molecule. And this is probably uh, the most important part of, of this uh, uh, section. Getting a good structure is going to be required every time we do any calculations. Um, and the first part is simply just drawing the molecule in WebML. Uh, this is going to be pretty easy. You click, you drag. Uh, after a couple of molecules, you'll get pretty good at this. Um, the area where people have some, some issues is in the, the cleanup. Um, always clean up the structure using one of the cleanup tools, but don't trust them. Neither one of the cleanup tools knows any chemistry. And both are really, really fast, easy estimates of the structure, neither of which is particularly accurate in all cases. We have the comprehensive uh, cleanup uh, for the idealized case, which involves like a VSCPR type approximation. We have the mechanics case um, on the right, uh, which involves a very simple molecular mechanics calculation. The important part is after you've cleaned up, look at the molecule. Does it make sense? Were there any error messages in the cleanup? Is everything right? Um, and this is the part where you have to think more than the program itself is capable of thinking. So make sure your structure makes chemical sense. Then submit the optimization and vibrational frequencies calculation. I really want to emphasize this vibrational frequencies part. You have to check to make sure the structure is the desired species you want. Um, and the only way to check that uh, is through that vibrational frequencies calculation. Once you're looking at the output of the molecule, spin it around, move it, think about it. Does it look right? Does it look what you would expect an intermediate or a product or uh, a reagent from a particular reaction to look like? Um, does it still make chemical sense? I mean, there's the chance that if you had a kind of uh, strange input structure, uh, Gaussian may have tried to make a move in the optimization. That was a bad move. And it could have taken it down a path that led to a, a really wacky structure. So make sure that this makes some good sense when you look at the, the molecule. And then, based on what we just did in part four with the vibrational frequencies, make sure that the vibrational modes make sense for the species you're looking for. If it's a reactant, an intermediate, or a product, all of the vibrational modes have to be positive. If it's a transition state, you're looking for one negative mode. And that negative mode corresponds to the motion that's at the top of the potential energy surface. Um, so be on the lookout for that. If you're trying to make something that's a, a, a stable minimum and you get a transition state, we're going to talk in part three about how to adjust the structure to, to get from a, a transition state to a, a stable one. Uh, and then a final bit, uh, it's always a good idea to consider any other stable, low-energy conformational isomers that you might have missed. Um, did you draw butane in such a way that you got gauche butane instead of anti-butane? 
Um, the only way to know about that is to, at the end, sort of think about how the molecule might adjust to be other uh, conformational isomers. And so this is a, a good procedure to have in your head and will definitely serve you well in terms of getting good structures uh, uh, in the M344 course.